Fox while performing that he took on the theme of police brutality. That's what he tackled in his performance at the BET Awards. You can see the performance. It's posted. Just go to our Facebook page at VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English on the Voice of America. I'm Katie Reaver. Today on the show, Jill Robbins brings us Ask a Teacher. We also hear a report from Mario Ritter. And we close the show with an American story. But first, the United States observes its Independence Day on July 4th. It normally includes massive public celebrations of music, fireworks, and food in cities and towns across the country. This year, however, much of the country is avoiding large gatherings or barring them. So we are turning to the ghost of Independence Day past to note some lesser-known history of the holiday. This day will be remembered in American history, wrote John Adams in 1776. People will honor it with fireworks and celebrations. He was talking about the 2nd of July. That is the day the Continental Congress voted in favor of independence from the British. But the date written on the Declaration of Independence is July 4th. So, since 1776, Americans have honored July 4th as the country's Independence Day. And July 2nd? Not so much. Adams went on to become the first vice president of the United States of America and its second president. He observed many July 4th Independence Days right up until he died on July 4th, 1826. That same day, a few hours earlier, Adams' lifelong friend, opponent, former vice president, and third American president, Thomas Jefferson, also died. It was the 50th anniversary of Independence Day. Five years later, James Monroe, the country's fifth president, also died on July 4th. And one president, Calvin Coolidge, was born on July 4th in 1872. Most Americans celebrate Independence Day with barbecues, parades, and, yes, fireworks. But a few celebrate by eating all the hot dogs they can. Every July 4th, since the early 1970s, a restaurant called Nathan's Famous has held a competition to see who can eat the most hot dogs in 10 minutes. The event involves 30 to 40 competitors, divided by sex. Women face women, men face men. The competition is held at Nathan's Famous in the Coney Island area of New York City. The 1916 restaurant grew over the years into a large food business with many stores. The undeniable star eater at Nathan's is Joey Chestnut of California. The 36-year-old has won the men's championship 12 times, including last year. He also holds the Nathan's record for most hot dogs eaten in competition, 74. New York native Mickey Sudo is Nathan's famous current women's champion. She has won the event six times, more than any other woman. 
but her opponent, South Korean-born Sonia Thomas, has eaten more hot dogs at the event. Thomas set the record in 2011, downing 40 hot dogs in 10 minutes. But that record did not last long. Thomas returned to Nathan's the following year and ate 45. Nathan's is holding the hot dog eating competition again this Independence Day. The event is not open to the public because of COVID-19, but it will be covered live on television and the web. So let's go back to those fireworks, probably the most common image linked to Independence Day. Americans really, really love fireworks. The American Pyrotechnic Association, pyrotechnic is another word for fireworks, reported that Americans spent $1 billion on ordinary fireworks last year. And the industry group said it also earned $375 million from sales of professional fireworks. But although fireworks are in popular use in America, they are rarely made in America. The huge majority is imported from China. And most American flags are made there too. Cynthia Erivo, John David Washington, Ava Longoria, Zendaya, and Aquafina are among the 819 people who have been invited to join the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. The organization that puts on the Oscars announced the new invitees this week. If they accept, which most do, they can vote in this year's Academy Awards to take place on April 25, 2021. The huge 2020 list includes a diverse group of people from all parts of the filmmaking industry. An Academy statement says... 45% of the invitees are female and 36% belong to underrepresented racial or ethnic groups. The Academy is made up of people who work in 17 different film industry fields. Invited actors include Anna de Armas from Knives Out, Brian Tyree Henry of If Beale Street Could Talk, Florence Pugh of Little Women, Lakeith Stanfield from Sorry to Bother You, Beanie Feldstein of Booksmart and Constance Wu of Crazy Rich Asians. Directors like Lulu Wong of The Farewell, Terence Davies of The House of Mirth, and Matthew Vaughn of Layer Cake are also on the list. Twelve people involved with last year's Best Picture winner, the South Korean film Parasite, were also invited to join the Academy. They include actors Chang Hae Jin, Jo Yo Jong, Pak So Dam, and Yi Jong Un. The Academy said that 49% of the new invitees are international and represent some 68 countries.
Other invitees include Ryan Murphy, who produced the documentary A Secret Love, and Bernie Taupin, who helped to produce Rocket Man, a movie about his work partner, music star Elton John. Academy President David Rubin said that the organization is delighted to welcome these distinguished fellow travelers in the motion picture arts and sciences. The Academy has worked to diversify its membership after receiving widespread criticism on social media about the 2016 awards process, which came to be known as Hashtag Oscars So White. The organization aimed to double its female membership and minority membership by 2020. The Academy has also announced a new five-year plan that includes diversity standards for award nominees. We look forward to continuing to foster an Academy that reflects the world around us in our membership, our programs, our new museum, and in our awards, the Academy Chief Don Hudson said in a written statement. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. This week, we received a question from Eric, a teacher in China. I am at a loss about how to use the following words correctly. Score, mark, point, and grade. For example... If a student answers my question correctly in class, should I say, I will give you two points for your success? Or should I say, I will give you two marks? Another question. How should we call the numeral that we put on students' test papers? Is that a mark? Or grade? Or point? Or score? And can I say, in this test, student A's grade is two points higher than student B's? Or should I use mark or maybe score instead of grade in this situation? Eric, China. Dear Eric, these are good questions. It is easy to mix up the many similar words connected to measuring student performance. First, I will give the meaning of each word. Then I will answer your individual questions. A score is the total number of points that a student earns on a test or other schoolwork. For example, suppose you are telling your students about an upcoming test. You could say this. Each section is worth 25 points for a total score of 100. You can also use score as a verb. In that case, it means to get points. Elaine scored well on her science test. The word mark is generally used in British English for the American word grade. Both mean the same thing, a measure. Teachers in the United States are more likely to use the word grade for the number or letter that indicates how a student performed in a class or on a test. In the U.S., for example, many students get letter grades to represent their numeric score for a single paper or exam, as well as an entire term of study in a subject. A point is a numeric unit that is used in tests and other schoolwork. We also use this word for classroom activities and games. For example, you asked about what to tell a student who has done well in class. I would say, I will give you 10 points for your correct answer. Or you might explain before you ask a question. I will give you 10 points if you answer this question correctly. Now, let's go over a few differences. The difference between the words grades and points 
is that a grade is usually based on the number of points scored. For example, if 100 points is the total and the student got between 90 and 100 points, the student gets an A grade. A grade of B would go to scores of 80 to 89. C is for 70 to 79, and so on. In the U.S., a grade is almost always represented by a letter and points by numbers. When talking about the difference between two scores, we could use a sentence like the one you asked about. Your score is five points higher this week than it was on last week's test. You will get a good grade for the term. Thanks again for the questions, Eric. They were grade A. What question do you have about English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. That's Ask a Teacher for this week. I'm Jill Robbins. Today we tell a traditional American story called A Tall Tale. A Tall Tale is a story about a person who is larger than life. The descriptions in the story are exaggerated, much greater than in real life. Long ago, the people who settled in undeveloped areas in America first told tall tales. After a hard day's work, people gathered to tell each other funny stories. Pecos Bill was a larger-than-life hero of the American West. No one knows who first told stories about Pecos Bill. Cowboys may have invented the stories. Others say Edward O'Reilly invented the character in stories he wrote for The Century magazine in the early 1900s. The stories were collected in a book called The Saga of Pecos Bill, published in 1923. Another writer, James Cloyd Bowman, wrote an award-winning children's book called Pecos Bill, The Greatest Cowboy of All Time. The book won the Newbery Honor in 1938. Pecos Bill was not a historical person, but he does represent the spirit of early settlers in the American West. His unusual childhood and extraordinary actions tell about people who believed there were no limits to what they could do. Now, here is Barbara Klein with our story. Pecos Bill had one of the strangest childhoods a boy ever had. It all started after his father decided that there was no longer enough room in East Texas for his family. Pack up, Ma! He cried, neighbors moving in 50 miles away. It's getting too crowded. So they loaded up a wagon with all their things. Now some say they had 15 children, while others say 18. However many there were, the children were louder than thunder. And as they set off across the wild country of West Texas, their mother and father could hardly hear a thing. Now, as they came to the Pecos River, the wagon hit a big rock. The force threw little Bill out of the wagon, and he landed on the sandy ground. Mother did not know Bill was gone until she gathered the children for the midday meal. Mother set off with some of the children to look for Bill, but they could find no sign of him. Well, some people say Bill was just a baby when his family lost him. Others say he was four years old, but all agree that a group of animals called coyotes found Bill 
and raised him. Bill did all the things those animals did. He became as good a coyote as any. Now, Bill spent 17 years living like a coyote until one day a cowboy rode by on his horse. Some say the cowboy was one of Bill's brothers. Whoever he was, he took one look at Bill and asked, What are you? Bill was not used to human language. At first, he could not say anything. The cowboy repeated his question. This time, Bill said, Varmint. That is a word used for any kind of wild animal. No, you aren't, said the cowboy. Yes, I am, said Bill. I have fleas. Lots of people have fleas, said the cowboy. You don't have a tail. Yes, I do, said Bill. Show it to me then, the cowboy said. Bill looked at his backside and realized that he did not have a tail like the other coyotes. Well, what am I then? asked Bill. You're a cowboy, so start acting like one, the cowboy cried out. Well, that was all Bill needed to hear. He said goodbye to his coyote friends and left to join the world of humans. Now, Pecos Bill was a good cowboy. Still, he hungered for adventure. One day, he heard about a rough group of men. There is some debate over what the group was called, but one storyteller calls it the Hell's Gate Gang. So Bill set out across the rough country to find this gang of men. Well, Bill's horse soon was injured, so Bill had to carry it for a hundred miles. Then Bill met a rattlesnake fifty feet long. The snake made a hissing noise and was not about to let Bill pass. But after a tense minute, Bill beat the snake until it surrendered. He felt sorry for the varmint, though, and wrapped it around his arm. After Bill walked another hundred miles, he came across an angry mountain lion. There was a huge battle, but Bill took control of the big cat and put his saddle on it. He rode that mountain lion all the way to the camp of the Hell's Gate gang. Now, when Bill saw the gang, he shouted out, Who's the boss around here? A huge cowboy, nine feet tall, took one look at Bill and said in a shaky voice, I was the boss, but you are the boss from here on in. With his gang, Pecos Bill was able to create the biggest ranch in the Southwest. Bill and his men had so many cattle that they needed all of New Mexico to hold them. Arizona was the pasture where the cattle ate grass. Pecos Bill invented the art of being a cowboy. He invented the skill of throwing a special rope called a lasso over a cow's head to catch wandering cattle. Some say he used a rattlesnake for a lasso. Others say he made a lasso so big that it circled the whole earth. Bill invented the method of using a hot branding iron to permanently put the mark of a ranch on a cow's skin. 
That helped stop people from stealing cattle. Some say he invented cowboy songs to help calm the cattle and make the cowboy's life easier. But he is also said to have invented tarantulas and scorpions as jokes. Cowboys have had trouble with those poisonous creatures ever since. Now, Pecos Bill could ride anything that ever was. So, as some tell the story, there came a storm bigger than any other. It all happened during the worst drought the West had ever seen. It was so dry that horses and cows started to dry up and blow away in the wind. So when Bill saw the windstorm, he got an idea. The huge tornado kicked across the land like a wild bronco. But Bill jumped on it without a thought. He rode that tornado across Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, all the time squeezing the rain out of it to save the land from drought. When the storm was over, Bill fell off the tornado. He landed in California. He left a hole so deep that to this day it is known as Death Valley. Now, Bill had a horse named Widowmaker. He got that name because any man who rode that horse would be thrown off and killed, and his wife would become a widow. No one could ride that horse but Bill. And Widowmaker, in the end, caused the biggest problem for Pecos Bill. You see, one day, Bill saw a woman. Not just any woman, but a wild, red-haired woman riding a giant catfish down the Rio Grande River. Her name was Slewfoot Sue, and Bill fell in love with her at first sight. Well, Bill would not rest until he had asked for her hand in marriage, and Slewfoot Sue accepted. On their wedding day, Pecos Bill dressed in his best buckskin suit, and Sue wore a beautiful white dress with a huge steel spring bustle in the back. It was the kind of big dress that many women wore in those days. The bigger, the better. Now, after the marriage ceremony, Slewfoot Sue got a really bad idea. She decided that she wanted to ride Widowmaker. Bill begged her not to try, but she had her mind made up. Well, the second she jumped on the horse's back, he began to kick and buck like nothing anyone had ever seen. He sent Sue flying so high that she sailed clear over the new moon. She fell back to earth, but the steel spring bustle just bounced her back up as high as before. Now, there are many different stories about what happened next. One story says Bill saw that Sue was in trouble, she would keep bouncing forever if nothing was done. So he took his rope out, though some say it was a huge rattlesnake, and lassoed Sue to catch her and bring her down to earth. Only she just bounced him back up with her. Somehow the two came to rest on the moon, and that's where they stayed. Some people say they raised a family up there. Their children were as loud and wild as Bill and Sue were in their younger days. 
People say the sound of thunder that sometimes carries over the dry land around the Pecos River is nothing more.